Let's take our hymn books and turn to 176. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. As thou didst break the loaves beside the sea, beyond the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord. My spirit pants for thee, O living word. Bless thou the truth, dear Lord, to me, to me. As thou didst bless the bread by Galilee, then shall all bondage cease, all fetters fall, and I shall find my peace, my all in all. Thou art the bread of life, O Lord, to me. Thy holy word, the truth that saveth me. Give me to eat and live with thee above. Teach me to love thy truth, for thou art love. Oh, send thy Spirit, Lord, now unto me, that he may touch my eyes and make me see. Show me the truth concealed within thy word, and in thy book revealed I see the Lord. Well, if you will, look with me in Ezekiel chapter 16 once again. Continue our reading commentary in this chapter. It's a long one. We're taking it in little bites. And for this reading, it will be Ezekiel 16 from verse 15 down to verse 34. Ezekiel 16, beginning with verse 15. And here in verses 15 through 19, we have the Lord accusing Jerusalem of acting like a harlot. Now, there's some pretty graphic language that comes down through here. And yet, it's how the Lord directed Ezekiel to write it. What it does, it just shows us how abominable a holy God considers idolatry and compares it to what we would call physical fornication and harlotry but there's nothing worse than the spiritual that any deviation from the truth is worse even than physical adultery or fornication or harlotry but here in verses 15 through 19, we have how it is that the Lord describes Jerusalem in that day. Now remember, the Lord's raised up Babylon already. They've come down two times and taken out people from the land, and they're awaiting that final destruction of the temple of Jerusalem. And people may have been wondering, well, why is God doing this? Well, he explains why. This is the indictment right here in verses 15 to 19. He says, But thou didst trust in thine own beauty. Compare that to people that trust in their own works for righteousness and consider it to be something before God. 
and playest the harlot because of thy renown. In other words, a pride of place. Here they were, a people that God had brought out of nothing, as we saw last time, just like a baby cast out into the forest, and God brought them out of Egypt and established them in the land. But there we see they became proud of who they were and pourest out thy fornications on every one that passed by, his it was. And of thy garments thou didst take, and deckest thy high places with diverse colors, and playest the harlot thereupon. The like things shall not come, neither shall it be so. Thou hast also taken thy fair jewels of my gold and my silver, which I had given thee, and madest to thyself images of men, and didst commit whoredom with them, and tookest thy broidered garments, and coveredest them, and thou hast set mine oil and mine incense before them. What had been set aside for temple worship, the worship at the temple, they were taken now and offering up to all of these false gods my meat also which I gave thee fine flour and oil and honey wherewith I fed thee thou hast even set it before them for a sweet savor and thus it was saith the Lord God so this is an answer to those that say well it really doesn't matter where you attend worship just as so long as you're worshiping well those that reason that way have never read what God has to say about it because there's true worship and everything else is false. And I know people argue and say, well, that's pretty narrow. Well, it's as narrow as God's holiness and his justice and those sacrifices that were to be offered were as a covering and atonement until Christ would come and fulfill it all. But they thought little of what God had set apart for worship and they began to take those things that were consecrated to true worship and began to go after other gods. So these are the indictments here beginning there with verse 15. You trusted in your own beauty. So here pride is at the root of Israel's decline just as it is in any false way. It's pride. Someone had said there's four different types of pride. Pride of place, pride of face, pride of race, and pride of grace. There are many that hold to what they call the doctrines of grace and how prideful they are of what they know. That's a pride of grace. But here it was a pride of place. They considered themselves to be beautiful and they gave themselves, notice there, they trusted in thine own beauty, just like the Pharisees, trusted in themselves that they were righteous. They considered that to be what was important and so then played the harlot because of their fame. It says there they poured out their harlotry in verse 15 to everyone that passed by. That's what a harlot does. Calls out to any that pass by. We have the same thing in religion today. All people are interested in is getting more people in, more members. And so they go out and proselytize and use all kinds of ways to try to get people to come join their congregations. So in this, there's really nothing new under the sun. Now when it says there, they played the harlot, that word harlot in verse 15 is a verb. It's all one word, played the harlot. And it's actually used 21 times in this description. If we were to read all the way through this chapter, you, you could count 21 times. If you want to do that, you can underscore it. But it's describing Jerusalem's unrestrained pursuit of her lovers. 
In other words, those of false worship. Remember that when the temple was destroyed, right next to where the altar was that God established, they had other idols already set up in the temple. And that's how the Lord describes their adultery. It's like a harlot calling after her lovers. The picture here is that if we put it back with what we saw last time, the innocent young woman that was graciously elevated to a status of a queen and then became a whore. Now it's interesting here, it says you took some of your garments and adorned multicolored high places. It's interesting that today they have the pride flag, which is really multicolored. And uh, they've taken the symbol of the rainbow, which is a symbol of God's mercy, and they've turned it into a licentious way of life that is nothing more than fornication and adultery. Nothing new under the sun. Why multicolored? Well, because every color represents something that people like. And that's when it says multicolored high places, these were colorful hangings in tents that were set up in, in high places, in other words, places of false worship. And these were seen in their feasts, in their fornicating, their idolatry, and even child sacrifice. All of this was going on in Israel contrary to what God had ordained. When it says there, and I don't want to get into too much detail here, but every word matters because this is the inspired word of God. In verse 17, when it says, and madest to thyself images of men, male images, this is actually referring to the private parts of a man that was part of this idolatrous worship. So you can see just how direct the Lord was in condemning what they considered to be, you know, there were male prostitutes and fornication was rampant. That's why females went to these, these particular places, but also males. And, uh, it was man with man, woman with woman, every sort of debauchery that you could imagine, all under the guise of worship. And then in verses 20 and 22, when it talks about the broidered garments and everything, those are handmade, just like works religion that they made and offered their flour and oil as a sweet savor. Look, look at the terms. These are terms that reserve for true worship, and yet they've taken and made it an abomination. It's like people today taking the Bible and these very scriptures that we read, turning it to lasciviousness, turning it into something else besides pure grace, the grace of God in Christ Jesus. They make a work out of it. The leaven. In verses 20 and 22, moreover thou hast taken thy sons and thy daughters whom thou hast borne unto me, and these hast thou sacrificed unto them to be devoured. Is this of thy whoredoms a small matter? That thou hast slain my children and delivered them to cause them to pass through the fire for them? And in all thine abominations and thy whoredoms thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth. He's talking about Remembered how it was that you were nothing and brought you up out of Egypt. When thou wast naked and bare and wast polluted in thy blood. Referring back to what we saw the last time. This is a horrendous practice. That was going on in the land. Where they would literally offer up their sons and daughters to be sacrificed to pagan idols. Such as the detestable Moloch that we read about when we were studying through the kings, causing them to, to pass through the fire. 
where they actually participated in that Canaanite cult of child sacrifice. King Ahaz in 2 Kings 16, you can read about it there, and King Manasseh, they were the two worst that took part in this horrific practice, thinking that somehow by offering these child sacrifices that somehow they would gain God's blessing. There's only one sacrifice that God has ever approved for blessing, and that is the sacrifice of his own son. He spared not his son, but to take your own children and to offer them to these idols, which were built, you can go back and read in history about these, with their hands out, it had a heating plate that they would heat up and when it was red hot, literally take and place a living infant in the outstretched hands of this idol and uh, to drown out the noise of the cries of the babies, these were accompanied often with drums beating loudly so that you couldn't hear the cries. You think, what kind of people would do this? Well, depraved, blind, ignorant, and yet today, even though we don't have parents particularly going and laying their children on some hot idol to be sacrificed, we find parents today sacrificing their children to religion begins very young. You know, Bible schools and summer clubs and all these things where they're trying to get kids early, make a decision. And once they do, they're sealed in that condemnation. They'll grow up believing that somehow because their parents dedicated them to God and the Lord and they made their decision that they're blessed. Here's what the Lord says about all this. You go down verse 23 to 26. Woe, it says, and it came to pass after all thy wickedness, woe, woe unto thee, saith the Lord God, that thou hast also built unto thee an eminent place and has made thee a high place in every street. Isn't that what marks religion today and so-called Christendom? The bigger the building, the better. The more that man can add to their places of worship and have people want to come just because it's so ornate. That's not anything new. That's the way it was back here. It says that thou hast built unto thee an eminent place and hast made thee an high place in every street. Thou hast built thy high place at every head of the way. We've often said that of certain cities and certainly could be said of ours. There's a, there's a worship center on every street corner. Well, that's the way it was there. There was to be only one place of worship. But they went and set up all these different high places throughout the land, has made thy beauty to be abhorred, and has opened thy feet to every one that passed by and multiplied thy whoredoms. That word high place, again, actually in the Hebrew, is the word that we have for a bordel house or a brothel. And that's how the Lord describes it. They're going there for worship, and the Lord says it's nothing but a whorehouse. Most places today would be shocked if you went in and stood up and said, this is nothing but a whorehouse, because Christ is not preached. Christ and him crucified. They have their embroidered garments they wear, and everybody likes to talk about their works and all that seems pleasing to their eye. And again, this is language which is very picturesque here when it says there in verse 25 that you have opened thy feet to everyone. Actually, it, it's referring to opening up the legs, spreading open your legs to everybody that comes by, just like a whore. And uh, it says there you've multiplied thy whoredoms such is the picture that we see described here by the Lord so what 
Now to finish this in verses 27 to 29, what are the depths? Just as we're appalled even in reading this, what are the depths of the sin of harlotry or of false worship? People don't have a clue today. But yet this still is a word that should be addressed in our day. It says in verse, well, I didn't finish reading verse 26, thou hast also committed fornication with the Egyptians, thy neighbors, great of flesh, and hast increased thy whoredoms to provoke me to anger. When it says there, thou hast committed fornication with the Egyptians, thy neighbors, great of flesh, as bad as the language has been to this point, this is even more shocking because the prophet here is describing this lover in terms that we would consider to be obscene, physical terms. And again, it's what the scriptures are teaching. Your neighbors with the huge organs, sexual organs. That's how it's described right here. When it says great of flesh, all of their worship was oriented toward these physical objects that they use for worship. And so the Lord says in verse 27, behold, you see that, behold, therefore, I have stretched out my hand over thee and have diminished thine ordinary food and delivered thee under the will of them that hate thee, the daughters of the Philistines, which are ashamed of thy lewd way. Thou hast played the whore also with the Assyrians, because thou wast unsatiable. Yea, thou hast played the harlot with them, and yet couldst not be satisfied. Thou hast moreover multiplied thy fornication in the land of Canaan, unto Chaldea, and yet thou wast not satisfied therewith. So you can see the depths here of their fornication. And so what does the Lord do? He, God's judgments aren't necessarily all of a sudden. Most people think, wow, if he's going to punish, it's going to be immediate. No, there's a slow death. Just like there's a slow apostasy into false worship, so there's a slow death here. God's response to this that provoked him to anger would be the taking away of their territory. And that's really what he did through the Assyrians. They came down and slowly but surely took away the land that had been given them until in around 722 before Christ, Sennacherib had completely devoured the north part of the land but now this was several hundred years later that this was taking place the lord was raising up the babylonians and for the same reason that he would remove them from that very land that they thought would be their help and their security there's a rude awakening it's the only way i know to put it when People have lived their lives, and the Lord then takes everything away, especially in the day of death. And suddenly now, they're looking around for the God that they were worshiping. He doesn't exist. They're going to find a holy, just, sovereign God that says, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. God's not impressed with men's works or religion or contribution. It's all corrupt anyway. And that because of a degenerate heart. It says in verse 30, how weak is thine heart? Why do people act the way they do? Well, it comes back to the heart. Saith the Lord God, seeing thou doest all these things, the work of an imperious, whorish woman. So what's the problem? Well, it's a heart problem. But even worse than physical fornication and uh, adultery verses 31 to 34 the lord describes jerusalem as worse than a harlot 
he says, in that thou buildest thine eminent place in the head of every way and makest thine high place in every street and hast not been as an harlot in that thou scornest higher, but as a wife that committeth adultery, which taketh strangers instead of her husband, they give gifts to all whores, but thou givest thy gifts to all thy lovers and hirest them that they may come unto thee on every side for thy whoredom. What he's saying is, usually if there's a harlot, she's out for hire and she gets paid for what she does. And he's saying, you're paying your false lovers that they might come into you. You're paying them. And the contrary is in thee from other women in thy whoredoms, whereas none followeth thee to commit whoredoms. And in that Thou givest a reward, and no reward is given unto thee. Therefore, thou art contrary. That's why the Lord says <laughs> you're even worse than a harlot because you continue to make payments. And that's what Israel was doing in that day. They were setting up alliances with these other nations like Assyria and Egypt and embracing their, in return, embracing their false way of worship. And... Uh, Yet all of that did nothing but increase wrath upon wrath against the day of wrath before God. We can say that the same thing is taking place today in so-called Christendom. I don't think that what we see in Christendom today is any different than what we're reading about here, where members of congregations commit lewdness, they don't consider it so. But anywhere you go to worship or attend where Christ alone is not exalted, any mixture of man's works or the look at me, the look at us, through entertainment and everything else that's going on, it can only bring God's condemnation. We'll stop there and Lord willing continue the reading on next time. Gracious Father, I thank you for your word, how sobering it is, and I pray that you would cause us, if you've been pleased to draw us out from what we did not know, perhaps at the time, was nothing but harlotry, but now being drawn to Christ to see that his work alone and uh, his glory alone is all of your glory and all of that righteousness necessary whereby sinners are made accepted before you i pray that you would cause us to rejoice that indeed you've drawn us drawn us out and separated us out to christ even though we have acquaintances and family members and others that are still pursuing these other gods in their works religion yet if any are yours for whom you paid the debt we have this confidence that you will yet draw them even as you have us but may we be warned but also may we be thankful if you've been pleased to so separate us out and we give you the praise and honor and glory in christ's precious name amen all right let's take our hymn books and sing our next hymn this is hymn number 172 O Word of God incarnate, O wisdom from on high, O truth unchanged, unchanging, O light of our dark sky, we praise Thee for the radiance that from the hallowed page a lantern to our footsteps shines on from age to age the church from her dear master received the gift divine and still that light she lifteth o'er all the earth to shine. It is the golden casket where gems of truth are stored. 
It is the heaven-drawn picture of Christ the living Word. It floateth like a banner before God's host unfurled. It shineth like a beacon above the darkling world. It is the chart and compass that o'er life's surging sea, mid mists and rocks and quicksands, still guides, O Christ, to Thee. O make Thy church, dear Savior, a lamp of purest gold, to bear before the nations thy true light as of old. O teach thy wandering pilgrims by this their path to trace, till clouds and darkness end it, they see thee face to face. All right, well, let's take our Bibles and look together in Matthew chapter 14. And my text is from verse 13 down to verse 21. And I've entitled this, Feeding the Multitudes. Normally you see the title, Feeding the 5,000, but that was just the men besides the women and children. And so I've simply entitled it, Feeding the Multitudes. And the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes that we're going to read about here is actually the only miracle that our Lord Jesus did that's recorded in all four Gospels. Even if it was recorded one time, it would be important. But the fact that all four of the Gospel writers recorded what we're studying here, and it would be worth almost a message in each one of those Gospels because each one brings light according as the Spirit directed them to write. But we're going to focus here on Matthew 14. And we're going to begin here in verse 13 and read down to verse 21. Then I'll come back and make a few comments. In verse 13, when Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. Now, notice it doesn't see, say that he healed everybody that was sick, but he healed their sick. He was extending his arm of compassion toward a great number of those that were there that were sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away. Isn't it interesting how the disciples here are giving instruction to the Lord as to what he should do? that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, We have here but five loaves and two fishes. And he said, Bring them hither to me. It's amazing that out of the whole mass of people, here were these five loaves and two fishes. And when you get over to John, you see that there was a lad that brought his along. 
somebody of no consequence at all, but the Lord had already prepared without him knowing that that lad should have these five loaves and two fishes and that he was going to feed the multitude with them. Everything comes from the Lord's hand, no matter how small or how great. And so he said, bring them hither to me. Whereas the disciples were saying, you need to send them away. The Lord's saying, no, bring hither to me that by which I will feed this multitude. And he commanded the multitude. You see, he keeps mentioning multitude, multitude, feeding the multitude. Commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up of the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. One basket for every one of the representative tribes of Israel. God's true Israel. And they that had eaten, it says, were about 5,000 men. But then it says beside women and children. So it's not even correct to say feeding the 5,000. Some have calculated that there were probably tens or maybe even 20,000 present when you count all the, the women and the children that would have been there besides the men. So this is the miracle as we're going down through these miracles that Christ did here. Now, verse 13 begins with when Jesus heard of it. And you go back up and see what had taken place. Herod had just, according to his wife's request, requested John the Baptist's head on a charger. And John the Baptist had just lost his head. Was this a surprise to Christ? No, he knows the end from the beginning. He purposed that John the Baptist would be his forerunner and was raised up to, to be so, and he served out his time, exactly as the Lord had purposed. And it says his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it, and went and told Jesus, again, as if somehow this would have been a surprise to him, and that's where we read when Jesus heard of it. As tragic as that was, yet it says he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. There was nothing that took place that ever caused Christ to deviate from his mission. John the Baptist was already his. And when he would lay down his life, he would lay down his life for John the Baptist. And John the Baptist would be raised again to ascend on high with him in glory when he had finished his work. But here was a multitude. See, the Lord knows those that are his. And so when he heard it, he departed from there. I don't believe this was out, en out of any type of cowardice on our Lord's part, but rather a, a perfect understanding of the Father's timing in all things. Oh, that we might be given this same grace, no matter what event occurs, no matter how tragic or dramatic, that we might be able to leave it for what it is and come aside even as the Lord did here. And so the Lord, some would say, well, he was just trying to get away and have some quiet time. No, he was going to where he would now feed these multitudes because it says there when the people had heard thereof that he had departed, they followed him on foot out of the cities. You can imagine these are tens of thousands of people now coming on foot to follow after Christ. You say, who's drawing them? Christ is. 
none can follow him except it be given of the Father. And we know reading later on in John, they weren't all those that came out to see him that were his. And that's why the Lord continued to insist, even with that multitude there in John 6. That's why I said earlier, you could preach an entire message from each one of these gospel witnesses. But John 6 is certainly a powerful chapter where the multitudes followed him. And yet the Lord did not acknowledged them all to be his. That's why he said, that, and they were offended. Many from that time turned back because he said that no man can follow him or come to him except to be given of his father. But that's where we see now the reason why the Lord was coming aside and the reason why he was drawing this multitude out to himself it tells us very plainly there in verse 14, he was moved with compassion toward them. You can read over in Mark 6 where it says, because they were as a sheep without a shepherd. How was our Lord looking on these that were gathered as a shepherd would his sheep? For I said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Now we know that some followed out of curiosity. Some followed because they wanted to see miracles. But the Lord knew those that were his. So while all the while he hides himself from some, yet we find him here drawing others. That's a strong term there, and I don't want to minimize it, where it says that he was moved with compassion for them. I don't know as we can aptly understand the love of God for those sinners that he gave to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to save. We talk about it. But when it speaks here of his compassion, this is not just some general compassion, but a gracious compassion that the Lord had on uh, these that were following him. And I noted here three particular qualities of this compassion. The first is that it is boundless because it's a great number. It overwhelmed the disciples, and yet it did not overwhelm the Lord. I know that the scriptures say that there's a number which no man can number that the Father has given to his Son, and for whom Christ Jesus came into the world to pay the debt. So in that we see the boundless compassion of God on behalf of sinners such as we are. Who can enter into it? And yet that's what this word describes when it says he was moved with compassion. There in verse 14. Toward them. And then the second description of this compassion that I would note here is that it is unconditional. It wasn't dependent upon them believing or doing certain things in order to receive his favor. And that's a reminder too of the grace of God that his grace is without condition on the sinner. People like to put conditions on and say, well, if you want God to be favorable to you, then here's Step one, two, and three, what you need to do. Everything I read in here is about our Lord acting upon these for whom he was moved with compassion because salvation's of the Lord and any deliverance is of the Lord. But thirdly, I would note here just how this compassion is great. The original word here for compassion is very expressive. When it says he was moved with compassion, it speaks there of being stirred in the very essence of one's being toward others. That's why I say I don't believe we can fully comprehend what it is the love of God when we 
your John 3.16 quote, God so loved the world. They just kind of speed through it. But think about that. God, that word so means in this manner loved the world, this world of sinners, that he gave his only begotten son, delivered him up, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. It was directed toward those who would believe on him. And it was toward them that God exercised this love, the very essence and being of God, his love toward those sinners that he sent his son to save. You say, how do we know who they are? Well, they believe on him. They're brought to rest and believe on him. And so here we see Christ not only as the the one drawing these to himself, but also feeding them. He gave them something to eat. Now again, the disciples were challenged by this. You know, what it, how, how, how can so many be fed? They were thinking only in terms of their own power and strength. Had they already forgotten some of the other miracles that they'd seen our Lord do, whereby he just simply spoke the word and it was done. But let's not be too tough on the disciples here because how many times, in spite of how God has been merciful and gracious to us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, have we still doubted and wondered and our flesh has caused us to strive and we would be much like these disciples, whatever the problem is, tell the Lord to send it away. Just send it away. When in truth, everything that we live and endure, even by way of affliction and trial, it's the Lord bringing it. That he might prove himself faithful, even when we don't see the end. And here we have an example of this. Remember, we had studied last time how he's the Lord of the harvest. And to pray that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Whose harvest is it? It's, it's the Lord's. Whose salvation is it? It's the Lord. And so here's this people that are hungry physically, but we can identify with it spiritually. He causes us to know our hunger and our need. But this is not something that can be resolved by man's mere attempts to resolve it. Can you imagine if they had to go in and literally try to find enough bread to feed all of these? But that's what works religion tries to do. They say, well, there's so many needs out there. We got to try to meet each one. And so they're busy about trying to do these things, but that's not the solution. I note here that when they said, or the Lord said in verse 16, when they said, send them away so they can buy their own victuals. That's the religion of free will. Let each one do what he can. But that's not the gospel. The gospel here is in verse 16. Jesus said unto them, Take need, they need not depart. Give ye them to eat. So with the Lord as the compassionate Savior here, number one, I see that there is never any circumstance that will make any to have to go away. I know we struggle with this sometimes because we wonder, will the Lord receive me in my need? Well, remember what is written over there, and we'll look at it in John 6. And let this be an encouragement for some of us that may be facing questions about whether the word of the Lord's or not. I've never read in scripture where the Lord has ever sent away a needy sinner. And that should give us some comfort. Now he sent many away who were bound up with their own self-righteousness and their works. 
and he answered them not a word, but these here, when it says the Lord was moved with compassion on them, it was because it was for such that he came into this world, the needy, the poor. And here in John 6 and verse 37 down to verse 40, he says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, what? I will in no wise cast out. I will in no wise send away. Why won't he send them away? Because it's the Father that's given them to him. He said, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son, that's why these here were following him. They had heard of him. They were following him. And believeth on him. That order is important. First God gives eyes to see. And then comes the believing. But it's that they may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up the last day. So there's no circumstance. That will make you have to go away. As a needy sinner. Secondly. There's nothing that our Lord Jesus. Would make you want to go away. I'm confident that had the Lord said, send them all away, they would have stayed right there. <laughs> to whom shall we go? Is what the Lord said to Peter and the others. Will you also go away? To whom shall we go? Thou art the one who has the words of eternal life. And so I don't see even here where any of these would have wanted to go away. To me, that's, a, that's an important point. Recently had a friend suffering deep depression for some time. And he just kept telling me, Ken, I've known these things all my lifetime. But I just, I, I can't believe. I can't believe. And he said, I fear more and more I might be just a cast off. And the Lord has given me over to my own reprobate mind. And so I remember telling him one day, I said, well, do you see yourself going away? Can you right now just throw it all down and say I'm done and go burn your Bible and just say no more? He said, I couldn't do that. I said, that, that's a good sign. That's an evidence of grace. Given the opportunity to go away, to whom shall we go? And I find that with myself. That this is the grace of God that has drawn me. It's his grace that's keeping me. And... Uh, Therefore, I continue to look to him. But thirdly, there's nothing even in the future as far as what we can expect to face that will ever make us need to go away. I remember, remember what the Lord said about Martha and Mary when Martha was busy about many things and he told Mary or said of Mary, she's She's chosen the good part, which was what? Being at his feet and worshiping him. I can't think of any thing as much as I know, you know, in my flesh, I'd be the first to go away. But with the Lord keeping, there's nothing I can foresee that will ever make me need to go away. Need to turn to somebody else. No matter what. And that's a good thing. So here, coming back to my text in Matthew 14, we see then the Lord distributing the bread in verses 17 to 19. And this shows us that the Lord is to be trusted at all times, whether with much or with little. We're not to despise the day of small things. I know when the question was asked, Concerning what was there was to eat in verse 17. They say unto him we have here but. You know they put the word but. <laughs> we have here but five loaves and two fishes. So even in the way they expressed it. They were expressing doubt. 
we were there in John chapter 6, but if you look in verse 9, even though Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't mention the lad, but in, in John chapter 6 and verse 9, it says there, there is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Thankfully, the Lord did not require even faith of them in order to accomplish this work that he was about to do. All he said was, make the men sit down. And uh, we could continue on read there in, in John. But what I see here is that in the Lord's hands, little is much. And when I think about the simplicity of the gospel, we're not to spruce it up or try to make it pal palatable to men. You stop and think about bread and fish. It's not a fancy meal. It's not something that people think, oh, well, I think I'm going to go out and eat some bread and fish. But it was the necessary sustenance. It was all they needed. And that's the way I see the gospel. It's the ne ne necessary sustenance of those that Christ came to save. But it's, it's simple. You know, it's the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's that with which the Lord feeds those that he came to save and did save. And the first thing he tells them to do here is to make them sit down. I like that. The gospel sets us at ease. He didn't even keep them standing and saying, well, go through now and give it to them while they're standing. No, everybody sit down. It's time to rest. And that's how I see it when the Lord's pleased to do a work. It's time to rest. We deal with a lot of people that are worn out through religion and customs and practices and all these things. Worn out. And then they come in and sit down in a place like here where it's the simple loaves and fish that are given out. I heard a preacher say one time, don't even try to explain what's in the loaf. Just pass it out. Give them Christ. And we can see here that what Christ was doing, it wasn't to draw attention to himself because we see there that when he took the loaves there in verse 19 and the two fishes, looking up to heaven. Why did he look up to heaven? Because he was on a mission of his father. This was all about those that the father had given him. And so he blessed and break it and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. Now it's interesting that you think about bread and fish. And what it represents. We know bread represents Christ. The bread of life. If you think about how bread is made. It's sown in the ground as a seed. And then raised up. Cut down. Milled. Baked. All of that's a picture of Christ coming in the flesh. And laying down his life. On behalf of that people that the father gave him. So bread is an apt symbol for Christ's person. And his work that he came to accomplish, what he endured when he was bruised, run through the mill, bruised and baked in the sense of enduring the wrath of his father on behalf of his people. You say, well, what, are, what about fish? Well, fish are living creatures made so, but when they're caught, what happens? They're killed. And then they're filleted, and then they're broiled, and then served to eat. So I see even in the fish a type of Christ who is like this living being. He is the living being. Caught, not for any sin of his own, but because it was so purposed and killed and broiled under the wrath of God. Why? To be given as life to the needy. So in either case, we have a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, 
you've seen the fish symbol that has been hijacked today by religion. But back in the early century, the fish was a symbol of what it was to be a true Christian. And it was made up of five different Greek words or Greek letters that combined together formed the symbol of the fish and how they wrote. You'd have to see the Greek letters to be able to, to see this accurately. But those five Greek letters put together were actually a confession of faith for Christians in the early church. And the Yoda, it means Jesus, Jesus. And the Kai is from the word comes, we get the word Christos, which is Christ. And then we get the Theta, which means God. Theos is God. And then you have the Epsilon, which means his son. You get the word Hulos from that. And then another Y, which is the Sigma. And uh, we get the word salvation from that. So that's the word Savior. So you put it all together, it means Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior. And that was the symbol when. Believers were being persecuted. It was the fish that represented their confession of faith. And wherever that fish symbol was found, they knew that that's where the Lord's people were meeting. The Roman government didn't know it at the time. But they would display these in meeting places where others coming by could gather and to meet. But here, to close this up, we see that in verse 20, I love this, they did all eat and were filled. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness for what? They shall be filled. That's why the Lord told the Samaritan woman, you come back to this well, you're going to thirst again. But the water that I have to give you, you'll never thirst again. What that means is we don't look for satisfaction anywhere else. And that we find in Christ our all in all. No matter what the number. You know, I don't know how many are of God's elect here. It says 5,000 men beside women and children that were there. But the Lord even there knew those that were his. All I know is I'm that needy sinner. And I'm the one that he's been pleased to draw by his grace. And has been pleased to reveal himself unto me and given me a hunger and thirst for him and whenever I can eat and partake of him I'm filled now I'll be hungry again I'll need to hear this word again but I'm filled that's what this these loaves and these fish represent all that Christ is and I find it interesting again we don't have time to look at it but in John 21 in verse 12, well, let's look at it. It won't take that long. John, John 21 and verse 12, after the Lord had raised from the grave, this is the third time that he had appeared unto his disciples. Had he not appeared unto them, they would have been completely lost. But in John 21 and verse 12, when he appeared unto them, they were out there fishing, trying to catch something. And... Uh, when they went to draw in the net, it was full of fishes. But what had the Lord done? He'd already prepared a meal on the shore. Verse 12, Jesus saith unto them, come and dine. I love that. And none of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord. But what did he, what did he tell them to come and dine? Verse 13, Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. Don't you know that when he brought out that bread and those fish, they had to go back and think, hey, this is him. But it was exactly what they needed. And so it is with us. We don't need anything more. We don't want anything more other than who Christ is and what he accomplished. And that's our fish. That's our bread. We'll leave it there for now. Certainly pray the Lord bless us in what we've heard. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 340.
Nearer, still nearer, close to thy heart. Draw me, my Savior, so precious thou art. Fold me, oh, fold me close to thy breast. Shelter me safe in that haven of rest. Shelter me safe in that haven of rest. Nearer, still nearer, nothing I bring. Not as an offering to Jesus, my King. Only my sinful, now contrite heart. Grant me thy cleansing, thy blood doth impart. Grant me the cleansing thy blood doth impart. Nearer, still nearer, Lord, to be thine. Sin with its follies I gladly resign. All of its pleasures, pomp and its pride, give me but Jesus, my Lord, crucified. Give me but Jesus, my Lord, crucified. Nearer, still nearer, while life shall last, till safe in glory my anchor is cast. Through endless ages ever to be, nearer my Savior, still nearer to Thee, nearer my Savior, still nearer to Dismiss and look forward to the next time, Lord willing.